Here we go. Many thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, we are back in the Academy of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. It is my greatest pleasure to invite Tommaso Valetti, uh, Professor of Economics at Imperial College Business School and also Professor of Economics at the University of Rome. Um, he is non-executive director to the Board of Financial Conduct Authority and he was uh, chief, the chief e competition economist of the European Commission between 2016 and 2019, basically involved in many, many important cases in the past. Besides economics, he is a keen flute player and he is excellent writer. I am recommending to you all his articles, papers like Doubt is their product, the difference between research and academic lobbying, or why big tech companies should engage with academia and why they don't. My greatest pleasure, dear Tommaso, the floor is yours. Please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the Konrad Adenauer and Stiftung for the invitation. So good evening, everybody. First, uh, a disclaimer, I'm an academic and I'm not engaged in consulting work. When you have academics, I think it's always important for the sake of transparency to just to state whether you're involved in any of these businesses or not. I'm not. So uh, I've got my brief keynote of 15 minutes and then we have um, a round table, uh, a panel where we talk about the DMA. But in my 15 minutes, I thought I would make four points and I'll try to be simple, hopefully. So first of all, I want to talk obviously about digital platforms, and this is opinions which I formed over the past uh, 20 something years of career as an academic, but also as a person very much keen on policy. So what happened in the past 20 something years? So the digital internet started in the early 90s, almost three decades, and uh, you know, to oversimplify, but I would see two phases in the development of digital platforms. The first phase that was open, Dynamic, it was um, anarchic perhaps, coming obviously from mostly from Silicon Valley, and those were the years where many of the brand names we are familiar with today emerged. And it may be just a coincidence, but I, I also want to say that those companies started when the very last antitrust case was run in the United States. So at the time there was Microsoft, that was the, the digital giant back then, that was trying basically to enter all sorts of new businesses that were emerging. At the time they were called browsers, they were called uh, media players, and, uh, but it was a, an antitrust case, the, the, the last one under the Clinton administration, so imagine how long ago it was. And um, maybe by coincidence that gave oxygen to a new generation of entrepreneurs and startups. That phase was also a phase where there was a good deal of academic involvement. As I'm an academic, so I'm interested to see what my peers are doing. Let's not forget, for instance, the uh, Brin and Page, so the founders of Google themselves, they were finishing their own PhD in Computer Stanford in, um, in 1999, in uh, Computer Science at Stanford. Okay, so that, that, that was uh, you know, the, the origin. And then we kind of lost track and we didn't understand that then things change pretty soon, despite, in theory, economists could tell you there are economies of scale, network effects. And we have uh, then the second half of uh, the, this um, you know, two decades, three decades almost, of uh, digital platforms where we have um, incredible consolidation, where we have dominance emerging, abuse emerging. Uh, we depend, so we, we must have witnessed all our, ourselves how our lives are totally dependent on, uh, for, no, for good and bad reasons, on uh, a handful of American companies. So during the pandemic, you must have seen it y yourself. So what's it, what's, it, this is a bit less known to the general public. Obviously, here in the audience, uh, there are people which are experts in the, in, the, in the fields. But Google has been, for instance, dominant in search. And by dominant, I mean in excess of 95% of uh, global searchers, excluding China for the past 14, 15 years. So th th this is not the idea that these markets are subject to rapid dynamics. I mean, this is, this is long, okay? And you can find similar, and if you look at uh, you know, searches, not on desktop, but on mobile phones, it's even more. And because on mobile phones, there are only two operating systems. One is owned by Google, that's Android. 
and uh, when I was at the European Commission, we ran cases because uh, Google was abusing its uh, dominance there in order because they saw that there was the mobile market emerging. But Google is, uh, is also paying uh, in the range of $15 billion a year to Apple to be pre-installed as search engine on Apple too. So if you are a rival, a rival search engine, you don't have access to Android because it's Google, but you don't have access also to, to the iPhone for, because also Google pays to be there. Okay, so similar numbers, maybe not as large, but would be in social networks for people age 30 and above. Uh, there are uh, statistics you can get from Amazon. Uh, last year, 80% of the people in Germany and 70% of the people in France, or the other way around, I don't remember, bought on Amazon during the day, uh, du during the year, uh, during the pandemic. So this is where we are depending. So this is the opposite of what we call resilience. You know? Resilience is when you have alternatives. In, if instead, if you depend on very few, this is not a very resilient system. So as I said, this is a bit less known that this has been going on for long so in, in a sense it's very welcome all the policy developments that we have it's a bit too late well it's definitely too late but the narrative often is still it's all good you hear that you know competition is one click away where the dynamics is going to fix the problem what's the problem anyway so um we we, we are we we are um always um chasing a little bit what's happening in this market so it's good that we realize and there are finally le legislation coming that were long overdue first point therefore these two phases of digital platforms second what's different when it comes to big tech so we had disruptive innovation in the past and we cannot say that i don't know the steam engine wasn't important or electricity or railways but what's what's dif what's different when it comes to big tech i think there are um, a couple of features which are really new one, this, which is well known, is the speed and the reach of these platforms. This is unprecedented, so the ability to connect 3 billion users on the Facebook network is new. So you didn't have that in the past. So speed and reach, but also something more subtle, which is almost paradoxical. And the paradox there is that these platforms have um, eliminated barriers especially in geography. So, you know, I can talk to somebody in a different continent. I can find a product on a different continent. So it has um, eliminated especially geographic barriers. And that's good. And this is also railways, perhaps, has eliminated barriers. But then it has also recreated barriers in, uh, in ways which are much difficult to, 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 to understand. So for instance, uh, if I open my social networks now, I would be targeted with advertising, which depends on my own profile. Okay? And if instead uh, Johnny or Christina or Pencha are opening their own social networks, they will have uh, different messages, different news. They will be reading different things, will be exposed, and have no uh, possibility to know what they are seeing because I'm not them. I'm, I don't have uh, their own profiles. Okay? This is really, no, all the silo system. So this is more, much more intangible. So where we be become individually as relevant markets in a, in a, in a competition law uh, jargon, which makes it very difficult for regulators to deal with these companies, okay? because it, it doesn't belong to any box. Just, just to give you perhaps example, which are just, just by analogy, in the old world, I could see if segregation exists in cities just by walking in a city. Okay? And I could see whether downtown there were only black people uh, deprived or not, but everybody could have access to that. Now this possibility is not available. So I don't know if there is segregation. There is, there is probably segregation, but I don't have the possibility to become a different persona from what I am because my digital profile, my history, my, my different connection have uh, uh, identified me as a person which is different from another person. So this is much more intangible, but these barriers exist, okay? These, these barriers exist and this is completely new, completely new and explains it to a large extent why it's been so difficult to put these companies into boxes belonging to the old world. So this paradox of barriers being eliminated but also barriers being rebuilt in ways which are very difficult to find. The third point is again another paradox. It's about data. This is uh, uh, three days about data. The paradox about data is that you know, an unprecedented trove of data about us has been collected over the past 20 something years by the digital giants that we are all familiar with. None of this data has ever been made available to academic, independent researchers to, to see what's going on. Zero, zero. So I'm, not, uh, I'm, I'm not exaggerating, zero. Okay. 
and zero, especially to the economies. They are just, uh, so the paradox there is so much data, but we cannot use we as, as, as academics. And why is that important? It has huge implications. It has huge implications, not, not just uh, in a parochial way as an academic, but more also as a, as a system of checks and balances that we need in a democracy. So academics, and I speak for my field, I don't want to overgeneralize, of course, but academics, if they don't have data in economics now, they cannot publish, because uh, they, we, we, we have to publish empirical work. And if we cannot publish, we perish, as, as the people say, publish or perish. So if you know you're not gonna find data, you walk away from a field, you're gonna go somewhere else. You're going to be looking at, maybe, I don't know, maybe developing countries. You're going to run experiments there. You're going to do, maybe there is data coming from central banks, so you study monetary economics. When it comes to digital platforms, since no data was ever being made available to academics for publication purposes, you have generations of academics that did something else. They walked out, because otherwise they would have been dead. And so this has really slowed down, in a dramatic way, our understanding about the field. So, a paradox there for me is that now, in 2021, if I speak to the average economist, they would tell about something about digital platform, which is something we already not knew 20 years ago. They would say, oh, digital platform, oh, but they're efficient because of network externalities. However, network externalities also bring the risk of monopolization. There is a trade-off. Well, thank you so much. Okay? I think, is that very deep? Is that, is that so deep? But this is something that we could have said 20 years ago, if not even earlier. Okay? And our understanding has stopped. And this is important. Again, it is important because in the, in the conversations we have, we, we lost the generation of talent that have not looked into this. Uh, there are solutions there. For instance, I'm very hopeful of, I'm not an expert of the, of, the of, the, of the Digital Services Act, the DSA, but there is a provision there, which is Article 32, which I understand that finally some data will have to be given to scientists, but we, we need to gear up to be ready also for that, which I don't see really happening yet. So this was the, the third point, the paradox of data, which are so much available, but in, the, in this respect, I have no hope that there is going to be any change from the digital giants themselves. Why? I personally, when I finished my job at the Commission, since I had so many ideas of interesting research questions, important research questions, I approached some of what I thought would be the more open-minded among the big tech. For some big tech, I just gave up. But some I thought they were more open-minded. We tried to have a discussion about giving data to researchers to have a, a, a research center, and the conversation didn't go anywhere. Because at some stage, they only saw the downside, the, the downside of, uh, they would basically ask him, but what is, what do you want to prove? Okay, what are you going to find? I said, but how, how can I know what I'm going to find? It's not a good research question if I know, already know the answer. And so, and, and, uh, and they didn't see the, 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 any interest in that. And so, and, and as soon as you have the lawyers brought into the room, they will say, no way. And they started you know, attaching strings which are unacceptable for the integrity of research. So I just gave up. I said, no, thanks. But still, we need some regulatory intervention. Otherwise, there is an impasse that will, will never be sold. The last and final point that I want to make is about um, the fact that as a chief economist of DigiComp, I ran some cases, so I had the opportunity to, to see some of the data that obviously I couldn't use because there is a conf confidentiality. But by looking at the data, I updated also my beliefs as an economist. In particular, I saw looking at the data in the you know, Google Shopping on the, or Google Android, there is a lot of inertia in consumer behavior. And uh, there is not such a thing as a representative consumer. There's a lot of heterogeneity too. But it was interesting. So I, I saw that some of the basic tenets of um, perhaps an oversimplified economics that would assume lots of rationality was not in the data, whatever. So we are a constant, massive A-B test is being run on us by showing us something on the top of the screen, on the bottom of the screen, make it larger, make it smaller, and see whether we actually click on ads. This is happening on a, on a gigantic scale on, a, on every day, and there is lots of behavioral traits that, that the companies exploit in order to sell more ads. So, but what was interesting is that I saw all this, you know, we know behavioral economics has been out there for a while, but it doesn't even uh, really percolate into competition law, that's fine. But when I was talking about the findings with other colleagues coming from different fields. 
say, uh, a social psychologist I was talking to recently, and said, well, what we knew about these uh, particular things that people only look top right, bottom left, or something like this for the past 20 years. We, we ran experiments. But when I spoke to my colleague, academic colleague coming from uh, social psychology, uh, there were interesting discussions there because I said, but how come two things? Why what you know has never been brought to the attention of the policymakers, okay? Aren't you interested in that? Like policymakers, they were saying, which policymakers? Do you know there is an ongoing debate to, to, re to regulate digital platforms? No, we are not aware in academia that there is uh, this kind of ongoing discussion. So a total disconnect both ways, okay? So the social psychologist's research, important research, was not brought to the attention of people that would have found it relevant, and vice versa. The social psychologists didn't even have a clue that there is an important policy discussion out there. So the last point I want to make is that currently there is, and today obviously is an exception, but an exception that proves my general proposition, which is that there is an incredible lack of diversity of views when it comes to the discussion in competition policy and digital platforms. So I was in Brussels full time for three years. I, I had to go to DC several times, and the discussion there were completely hijacked by lobbyists or policy people or so. So the, 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 the people that the big tech are sending to the discussion are not the computer scientists. You know, they're not going to explain you how an algorithm works. They are not the engineers. They are, they are not people that, that, that know how things are working. They send you policy people who are very well educated and eloquent just to tell a story that the company wants you to hear. And the narratives are still there. They are still leading the discussion when it comes to Brussels or Washington, D.C. So, for instance, we still hear uh, small and medium enterprises. They love us. They need us because they need us for their businesses. I found it really interesting that Facebook and Google are buying ads in airports and in traditional media, the opposite of the hyper-targeted advertising they do to say SMEs, they love us, they need us, etc., etc., because they want to affect the policymakers, because the policymakers which are still going through airports and the policymakers which are still reading the, the Financial Times, obviously it's not the SMEs, but that's what they do because that's a narrative they want you to hear. And similarly also, the public affair people will, t will tell us, oh, killer acquisitions. Acquisitions are so bad because that's the channel for exit, exit of the entrepreneur. You're going to, again, disincentivize them uh, completely. Or uh, privacy. Privacy, we care about privacy, but privacy has nothing to do with competition. Uh, privacy is about consumer protection. It's a different field than you had from Johnny before, that obviously this is completely wrong. So having more diverse, diverse views. And, and this is perhaps one of the achievements of the last few years, I, I would think. So it would have been unprecedented to have a privacy expert, competition expert, and also this, you know, the, this, the civil society being out there. And, uh, and, uh, but still, there is a, a coordination problem because these are individuals. They don't have the same funding as the, the big tech corp, 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 corporations. But this is where I want to end uh, before our, our panel on the DMA, that there is now, I, I would think, a very good um, training motion now in uh, Europe, which is great. Okay? Lots of details will be incredibly important, of course, but the training motion has finally left the station. That's exactly what we wanted. And we have to keep up this good energy, all of us. We also have to remain healthily skeptical, I think, of the main narratives that we'll still hear because, you know, the money at stake is so large and you have uh, you know, big departments which are meant only to, you know, just to, 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 to contrast what I may say in a, in, a, in, a, in a conference, but just multiply it by orders of magnitude. But this is what we need to do. So keep the diversity of, this, of the discussion, keep it open, and also, as somebody said in the previous session, we have, through, by, by doing this, we also have to avoid uh, making the mistake of uh, solutionism. The mistake of solutionism is always be concerned about particular problems of that moment. Because if you just find a particular problem, a particular fix of a problem, and we've dealt with cases in, in the past, not particularly well through antitrust, but the risk is that the big picture is, uh, is, not, is not in front of us. Okay? So we have to avoid this uh, technological solutionism. Tell me what the problem is and we'll give you a small fix. And we have, as somebody said earlier, is to sit down together and also imagine what we want for Europe. Okay? Because we are European citizens and we want to have um, a very prosperous digital future for European citizens. Thank you very much. <laughs>